My name is Jacqueline Woodson. I am a novelist. I am a MacArthur Fellow, and I am the Education Artist in Residence here at the Kennedy Center. So when I was a kid, I think um, we had very limited television. You know, we, I mean, in many ways, I mean, we had limited channels <laughs> on the TV, but we also had limited time in which we could watch TV. So whenever we wanted to turn on the television, if it was uh, what my mom considered an inappropriate time, she would say, go find a book. Um, go sit down and read. Go play a game. Um, and because of the way games existed in our house, there were very limited games we could play. We weren't allowed to play games with dice for a long time because my mom said it sounded too much like gambling. Um, and so, you know, we had checkers, we had chess, um, and we had a myriad of other games like that were big in the 70s and 80s, like Ants in Your Pants and, um, uh, and a lot of art materials my mom kept. We always had crayons, we always had coloring books, we always had paper. Um, so it was almost like this Montessori household <laughs> in this way. But, um, but I was very into, I loved reading, I loved being read to. I was a really slow reader, so I just loved sitting with words and, and poring over them again and again. Um, and I, I loved, um, looking at art, like one thing we had were the child craft encyclopedias and inside those, like the C had all these pictures of cats, um, you know, the D had all these pictures of dogs and, and I would spend just hours staring at images and there was something about the way, looking back on it now, the images um, told stories for me in the same way that picture books, when you take away the words, they have their own stories. Um, so that, that, that's some of what I was into. I, I really um, think because from a very young age I wanted to be a writer, I wanted to be a storyteller. Looking back on it now, whether it's true or not, <laughs> my memory is that of someone who was engaged in letters a lot. I, I would say the first book that I remember looking back on it now having a huge impact on me was Little Match Girl by Hans Christian Andersen. I remember reading, uh, I remember my sister as a young person reading Hans Brinker and the Silver Skates to me. <laughs> and I forget who wrote that book, but, but I remember coming across this Hans Christian Andersen book and thinking, oh, that must be Hans Brinker from the Silver Skates. Um, and, and, but it was the story of the little match girl. And the first time I heard it, my teacher read it to me. And she would read us a book at the end of the day if we were good. But it seemed like we were good a lot because I remember her reading to us a lot at the end of the day. And, and the book that she read was Little Match Girl. And the story is a girl who's very poor. Um, and she's selling matches to try to get something to eat. And it's winter time, and she's like, please buy my matches, please buy my matches, and no one's buying them. And she ends up freezing to death. Um, but before she freezes to death, she strikes the matches, and inside the matches, there are all these images. So there's, she imagines herself with food on the table and a warm home. She imagines herself with clothes, to, you know, um, sufficient clothes. She imagines her grandmother alive again, and the two of them reunited. And then, um, and then she dies. And it was the first time I had heard a story where there wasn't a happy ending. And I thought that, you know, I kept thinking, oh, she's going to turn the page and everyone's going to live happily ever after. <laughs> like, like, that can't be the actual ending. And it was. Um, and I remember going home. I, from when I was a kid, we would go from public school, from our school, to the library, to the neighborhood library, because my mom worked full time. And we went to the library, and that's where we hung till she came to pick us up at 545. And that was the case for a lot of kids in the neighborhood. They went from school to the library. And the library was the, um, it was the place where we were safe, right? We knew the librarians were looking out for us. We knew we couldn't get into trouble because we had to be quiet, and they were very strict. And, and we did our homework, we, and we read books. So. Um, I got to the library and I, the first thing I did was 
find that book. And I just wanted to read it again because I thought my teacher had made a mistake <laughs> that maybe there was another version of it where that she lived happily ever after. And there wasn't, but I ended up reading the book all my life. I mean, I still read it. I read, I read it to my kids. Um, it's still something that gets me in the heart when I think about it. And, um, and what I wanted was I wanted a different ending, right? So in wanting a different ending, I think I wanted to create that in the world. So it really was, looking back on it, an introduction to empathy, right? Because here was someone who I didn't know having this experience that felt unfair to me, felt unright, and, and I wanted to change that experience for that person. I wanted that, per and I wanted that person to be okay. Um, and so, and I feel like it taught me that I could write books that didn't have a happy ending, um, even, but that there had to be hope somewhere in the story. And there was this hope in that book in that every time she struck a match, she had a moment of joy. Um, and and those, those moments of joy are throughout the book until that ending. Um, and even in the ending, you know, the idea is that she's reunited for, with her grandmother and wherever her grandmother is. But, um, but I feel like, the books like that that I read again and again taught me a lot about how I could tell story. Um, and another one was The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde, which was another book that, you know, and at the end of it, the giant falls dead. Like, so there was a period where there was a lot of dying at the end of the books that came after a lot of happily ever afters at the end of the book and books. And I think that I probably ended somewhere in the middle <laughs> as a writer. So the first thing I remember writing that got attention was a poem I wrote in fifth grade about Martin Luther King. And I remember my teacher not believing I wrote it because, um, because obviously it was good. <laughs> like, like and, she, and she thought my sister wrote it because my sister, she had had my sister, many teachers had had my sister and, and they knew she was a stellar student. They, you know, they knew she was, um, an academic, they, they knew she paid attention in a way that they didn't know I paid attention because they didn't see me yet. And, um, and I wrote this poem, my mother had to write letters and my mother came up, she's like, no, Jackie writes all the time, this is what she does. Um, and, and, and that was the first time I thought, wow, there's something here because I'm writing something that someone, a grown up, didn't believe I wrote, so there must be something to it. I was, I was still saying I wanted to be a writer. I wasn't calling myself a writer yet. Um, I think I really started calling myself a writer after, after college. And I, and I remember um, I was living, I, my roommate was uh, a very close friend of mine now, Linda Villarosa, and Linda um, is a journalist. And I, I had written Last Summer with Maze, and I had written my first novel, and then, um, there was a period where I was still trying to write, but we would have these parties, and during that time, you know, you would go to a party, and the first thing people ask is, what do you do? Um, and, and my sister has a great answer. She always says, about what? Like, but, but, my, um, but we put a sign on the door. When you enter this apartment, you cannot ask the person what they do. Because we, were, we felt like, I was saying I'm a writer, because, and then the next question would, would be, well, what have you published, right? It's always this way of having to legitimize yourself. And, and we didn't want that because um, we didn't want who we were becoming to be crushed by what we hadn't done yet. Um, and so I, I was calling myself a writer. I was writing all the time. I was sending stuff out. I was trying to get stuff published. I was waiting for my next novel to come out. Um, but I wouldn't let the fact that whether or not I had won an award or published more than one book or any of that stopped me from saying that I was a writer because I knew what I was doing was um, making it true. And the first um, point of, into making something true is naming it. And so I was saying, this is who I am. I'm not an award-winning writer. I'm not, not necessarily a published writer, but I mean, I had published some stuff, but I'm a writer. I write all the time.
At the time, right after college, I was working for a publishing company. I was working for a book packaging company where um, I was a receptionist, and then I moved into editing stories, editing other people's work. Um, and that work was um, actually state tests. Um, we were creating state tests. And I remember last summer with Mason, that was, um, I had, I was also writing, so I was writing reading the reading comprehension parts of standardized tests, much to my dismay looking back on it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. But I was trying to I would I was trying to make it relevant. So so I wrote parts of last summer with Mason as reading comprehension. Um, and and that work I knew wasn't feeding me. Like I was able to write, but it wasn't I wasn't writing what I wanted to write. And at the end of the day, I was too tired to write what I wanted to write because I had already been engaged in writing. So I remember I had the opportunity to write um, um, this book for um, this company that was just getting its footing. And they asked me to write a series of books that would go with these dolls. and. And, um, and I said I would write them, but I wanted to use a pseudonym. I didn't want to use my real name because I, want, I didn't want my real name to be attached to something commercial if this thing had ever, if this thing was ever to become big. Um, and it, it was a lot of money. And I remember thinking, wow, here I am struggling to pay my rent, not going out with my friends because I didn't have any money, and, um, and just kind of existing as this artist who was was not starving but definitely not well to do by any means um, and it was kind of this crossroads of like I can take this and then this might be the only thing my name would be attached to for the rest of my life or I could say I'll write it under a pseudonym you pay me and then I can go on and do my stuff as Jacqueline Woodson that wasn't going to be okay with the company and so I I didn't end up doing that and I I went on, I kept writing. Um, and then I got a fellowship at McDowell, which is an, uh, a space for artists to go and create art. And that, that was such a turning point because I was able to create a lot of art and, um, and start getting recognized to some extent as someone who was serious about writing. Um, but I think it was that moment of making that choice, like how am I going to be as an artist in the world? And do I want to be? this kind of commercial artist or do I want to tell stories that matter deeply to me that I'm going to want to go back to the shelf and pick up and read to somebody. I think for me one thing was I had grown up in a working class poor family. You know my mom was a single mom. Um, we lived in a community of people who did not have money, or, or some. There were a lot of two-parent households. Um, just about everybody on our block was a person of color by that time, because it was white flight, and every the white folks had moved on to Long Island and Westchester and the places that white folks went in the '70s. And it's funny because the neighborhood is Bushwick, which is a neighborhood in Brooklyn that's very well known now. And I always say it's the grandkids of the white flighters who came back to Bushwick who um, are there now. But but in the in the neighborhood of my childhood, it was predominantly black and Latino, um, and it was um, the fathers often had jobs in factories because they were um, either here via the Great Migration, newly here that way, or newly here via immigration. Some of them were probably undocumented, um, and the mothers often had side hustles like they sold Ava they sold cosmetics or they sold pants or they um, sold pot holders and 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 my mom had a job at Con Edison and and my grandmother once she came she was doing domestic work um, but they were, everybody was cobbling a living together and making it work and the kids were fed and, and we had clothes for school and we had a public school that we could go to um, and we went like um, and and so for me, coming of age as an artist, I was never afraid to be broke. 
Uh, and I think that was something that was very, that helped me a lot because it helped me make choices about how I would live my life as an artist. And I knew that um, I would be okay, you know, even if I had to keep working as a secretary. I worked at a bank for a while. Um, I worked for various banks as a word processing secretary. Um, I always knew that I would be able to find some kind of work to keep me afloat while I pursued art. And I think that that was, uh, that was the safety net, having had a history of coming from a people who knew how to make a way out of no way. And I think um, it's one thing that some people, when they haven't come from that, um, history are very afraid of. Like, what would it mean if I had absolutely no money? What would it mean if I, you know, don't, didn't take this job that um, didn't feed my soul um, and ended up broke? Like, I mean, ended up making another choice and, and um, being broke. But I think um, the thing about security, it comes in all shapes and forms, right? There's economic security, uh, financial security, and there's emotional security. Um, so for and mental security, and for me, I really wanted the emotional security. I wanted to be able to look at a body of work one day and say, I'm proud I made that. Um, and and there, is, um, there is no book that I've written that I regret writing because I felt like I wrote it to make money, <laughs> so. So when I was um, around, I must have been around 25, I moved to San Francisco because I was looking for an artist community. And somewhere in my reading, watching, whatever, I had heard that people who wanted to be writers and artists went to San Francisco. And, um, and I went there and it was so expensive. I had lived in an apartment with four other people, all of them I think med students. Um, and and I, couldn't, I had a hard time finding work as a, um, as a secretary, temp work, which is what I wanted to do. I had a hard time finding writing groups. It was very segregated in this way that was surprising to me. And I came back to New York, um, and I, I joined a writing group of women uh, um, who were um, queer women and straight women who were, um, who were just trying to write and tell stories and write poetry. And I think that was the beginning of understanding that the group, that the, you build the communities you want to be a part of. Um, and so, so, that, so I started making friends that way. And once I started publishing, especially publishing for young people, I realized how small the publishing world was. Um, and, and I started meeting people at conferences and um, universities. And over the decades, we just all began to know each other. I mean, for, I'm, I'm talking about going back to the 90s with Virginia Hamilton and Leo and Diane Dillon, and then all, you know, coming into people like Jeff Kinney and Kwame Alexander and Jason Reynolds and Rita Williams Garcia. But like this community, even before social media, or already orbited around each other, and then kind of grew closer as we got older. And and one thing that I found that I do get from the community is that support. Is that support around handling everything from um, the pressures of finishing a book when you're distracted or, or when you're stuck to asking someone to read something and see if this is okay or asking someone to bounce off a situation where you feel gaslit and you're like, is it me or is it, um, something else and knowing that you're going to get the truth because these are your friends these friends and this is your family um but but i i think that i went from kind of being this isolated young person trying to find 
my writer's community that I thought was some strangers on the West Coast <laughs> who would become my friend to growing a community much more organically and realizing that some of them hadn't even started publishing yet and weren't in that orbit and would become a part of that orbit and others um, were there uh, all along. You just didn't even know each other yet. So, so it's, um, I'm, I'm looking, it's so wild to be looking decades back and in, into the present and seeing the people who have survived this with me and also the people who I've met along the way. And it, it's huge. I mean, it, the community is huge. And it's not, you know. It's intimate in a way that um, we know that we're going to speak the truth to each other and speak truth to power and, um, and create something that hopefully is going to be there in some way, shape, or form for the next generation of writers who are also already a part of the community, the ones who are publishing. Like I think of someone like Angie Thomas, who is one of the younger writers, right, or Danielle Clayton, um, and not necessarily young age-wise, but young in terms of their publishing careers. But And then someone like me, who's been publishing for 30 years or something, um, and, and the way we can engage and support each other, even with all of these years between us. So my writing process has definitely changed over the years. Um, I used to call it the BC and the AC, before children, after children. Because <laughs> before children, there was a period I moved to, um, after McDowell, I got a um, fellowship to the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. And the idea of that was to get 10 writers, 10 visual artists together on, on this land, um, give them a stipend, and have them live together for seven months. You know, our, we each had our own spaces, but we were part of this community. And, um, and the hope was that we'd come to Provincetown, we'd see that it was an art mecca, and we'd stay. And, um, and I was one of the few that stayed. I stayed for five years. So after the fellowship was over, I found an apartment. Um, the rent was so much cheaper than New York. I was able to write full time. Um, I, not full time, but I also had some other writing gigs. I wrote for the newspaper. I taught. Um, a lot of my teaching was um, low residency, so I'd go away to teach it for 10 days and come back. Um, but it was really ideal for me in this way, until it wasn't, until I realized I needed to be back in New York City. But, but during that writing period, I wrote all the time, especially in the summer, um, because in the summer, Provincetown, because it was a tourist town, got super crowded, and, and I, didn't, I don't like crowds, so I would stay inside and write. And then in the winter, when the beaches were empty, I'd spend more time outside. But then I came back to New York, and I had developed this writing process of, of just spending long hours. I mean, I get up, have breakfast and coffee, and uh, go for a run, and then sit down and write for 8, 10, 12 hours. I mean, I, I just wrote lots. Um, and this is, of course, before the distractions of social media and all of that. Um, and then when I was pregnant with my daughter, I wrote all the time because I was writing to try to finish books before she got here because I thought she'd be, um, I, I thought she'd be, um, a distraction. <laughs> you know, I thought I'd have to ch uh, uh, change gears completely, but what I realized was that you could be a writer and a mother. And, and so, um, so um, when I traveled, I traveled with her. When I, I wrote when she napped, I wrote um, later on when she was in daycare and, um, um, and then and in school, and then my writing process changed, and I realized that I had between the hours of 8.30 and 2.30 to write. And then started, had to start thinking mom thoughts about food and, and cleaning and, and, um, and engaging and being present. And so, um, and the same thing happened um, six years later when my son was born. It was, um, you know, the time with him and tra taking him with me everywhere and then, um, and then once he went, once we got childcare for him and uh, then I had between the hours of eight and one or whatever few hours we got 
for childcare. But but I learned to write around motherhood. Um, and then they were both in school full time, um, and I had all those hours. And by then, I I had learned all kinds of ways of procrastinating. <laughs> um, but but I had also developed the muscle uh, of the process, which is that if you don't write, it atrophies. And, and it, once it begins to atrophy, you begin to get cranky at the world around you and find ways to blame everyone else for that atrophy. And so I knew in order to stay emotionally okay and, um, and sane, I needed to write. Uh, and so, so that became my process and I, I always, um, I'm working. I'm always working on more than one book at a time because if I get bored with one, I'll move to the other. If I get bored with that, I'll move to the next uh, until one is really a part of me and I have to finish it. Um, I learned to write at night in the summers, especially I'll stay up till two or three writing because um, I didn't. I don't have to get up the next morning to get the kids off, um, and I learned to um, feel safe about. Um, showing my writing at earlier stages than I had once shown it to my editor, to, to my beloved, um, just because at some point I needed other eyes on it. Whereas when I was younger and more focused, my eyes were <laughs> enough until a certain period. But, um, but I think that's one thing that people get afraid of is um, something big coming in their life and changing their writing or taking it away. And, and I think the, the major changes in my life have only added, even the loss of my mom, you know, the, the things that have been about loss and the things that have been about gain, like motherhood. But um, I also think that um, it's so interesting. What I, from a very young age, one thing I always thought was, I don't want to ever put my backstory on my children. And, and the backstory that <laughs> I would put on them is I wanted to be a writer and didn't succeed, and therefore you have to be a writer. You know, and I see parents sometimes doing that, pushing their kids into the dream that they felt they didn't get to have or their deferred dreams. Um, and the other thing I didn't want was to say I was a writer and my kids would go to school and say, your mama wrote that book like 20 years ago. She's not a writer anymore. <laughs> so, so I think I was writing into trying to stay um, constant. <laughs> um, and and I, one thing I never dreamed was that my kids would not read my books. Like, you know, they wanted their own individual lives. And, and I never, you know, said, okay, we're gonna read one of mommy's books tonight. Like at bedtime, I've never done that. And, and they've never asked. <laughs> you know, we have so many writer friends and so many books and, um, and so many other things they could read. And, and my books were always a little more serious. And, um, but, they, but when, as they started getting older and they started getting assigned my books in school, <laughs> that was, you know, that was on them. It, it was pretty funny, though. <laughs> It's, it's interesting because um, in terms of thinking about that question of what if I can't make all of this work, um, once the parts are in motion, once the young people, that your kids are there, once the household is there and the partner is there, you really have no choice. Right? <laughs> right? The, I mean, I guess you can separate from the partner. Um, or you can, um, I don't know. I just think that you, you find a way to make things work. And, and there's not always going to be a balance. You know, there have been those times where I've, I've gone off um, to do an artist visit or something. And I got there and I'm like, I'd rather be home with my kids. Why did I just make this choice? to spend three days away from my kids. Um, you know, economically, I don't need to do it. Um, um, but, you know, in terms of this community, they need me. But if I, um, if I tried to visit every community that needed to see an author who was black, an author who was female, you know, all the ways that I come, I bring myself into those communities, 
I would never be home. So then the balance, and now, now, now I can mourn that, the fact that I can't be in all of these places, or I can mourn the fact that I'm not with my kids, or I can mourn the fact that I'm not with my partner, I can mourn the fact or, that I'm gonna come home and the house is gonna be messy and I'm gonna be cranky that no one cleaned, you know? So, um, so there is a way in which that we were told that lean in lie of you can be it all and you can be the super parent and you can be the super woman and you can you know make all of these parts work sometimes they don't work you know sometimes um sometimes something falls apart for a minute but you build it back together you know so i think about um i i just we just had this where um i was asked to speak in um in somewhere here in the DMV area. Um, and it was on my calendar. And then at the two weeks or three weeks ago, we finally got my son's eighth grade graduation date, and um, uh, which was the same day as this thing. And I was like, no, I can't do it. And the people were like, well, you said you, I'm like, it's my son's eighth grade graduation. And um, and they're like, yeah, but, but we have, you know, 500 people coming I'm like, Think about this as your child's eighth grade graduation. And then it gave me pause because I thought, they don't care about me in this way. What they care about is their event and having Jacqueline Woodson at that event. And, and here I am, writer, mother, partner, let me make a choice in this. And this choice is, of course I'm gonna be at my son's graduation, whether he wants me there or not, because he is in eighth grade and, and there is that, there is 14 year old childism. But, um, but it is that, that those kind of deep person, personal choices that are also, you know, interplaying with everything else that's going on. But yeah, it is, it is a question. Like, one thing I thought was um, I always wanted to be a mom. Like, in the same breath that as a young person I was saying I wanted to be a writer, I was saying I wanted to be a mom. Um, and there are all kinds of ways to get to motherhood. And I knew that one thing I didn't want, I wanted to be able to run with my kids. I wanted to be able to play double dutch with them. <laughs> you know, I wanted to be young enough to do some of the things with them. So I wasn't going to wait till I was 50 to be a mom, whether or not that's a possibility. Like, and, and that's not judging anyone who does wait. I knew that physically I needed to be in some kind of shape to be physically present for my kids. Um, um, and so, and I didn't, I didn't want to look back and have regret. And I think that's, that for me, that's the most destructive feeling is saying, I should have, I should have, I should have. Um, and, and so, hence the writing, <laughs> hence the motherhood, hence the partner, and making all of it work because, because it was important to me. And, and I think that um, it's what we have to, for me, it, thinking about what's important to me every day and really taking the time to be in that is, is matters. That's such a good question. Um, what keeps me writing out? It's funny, in terms of thinking about the people I've impacted, it's very, surreal you know i i think i know i get to meet some i don't get to meet as many as i know have read my work um and i'm always surprised like i was at a um, publishing party for black folks in publishing and um and there were these three women there and one was an editor one was an agent and one was a writer and they were all their late 20s and early 30s and they all said that they're in those fields because of me and I think I was surprised first because I was like but y'all are grown-ups like you know <laughs> and to realize that I had been writing that long is always surprising to me and to think that these little girls were sitting there reading like I want another Jacqueline Woodson book and and I had written those books that they were asking for just feels so surreal um and I think what keeps me writing is the times keep changing and they keep staying the same. So, so I think the ideas of community, of family, of being seen, of love, of 
the importance of friendship, of um, the importance of knowing your value. Like, uh, there, there are still young people in this world who don't have that. And, and there's still ways of telling that story that is new. So I think that's what keeps me there. Like, I'm working on a book now um, that's, it, that's very autobiographical, but is written in almost paragraphs. Like, you know, that's written in vignette because I'm, I know people are also reading differently and that white space matters and that young people are easily overwhelmed by words on a page in a way that they weren't in the early 90s or early 2000s or before COVID or before you know, social media. Um, but, but they still want story and they still want to be, they want to see themselves in story. And that for them, that's as, um, that's, that's as legitimizing as you know, seeing someone who looks like them on TikTok or seeing someone who looks like them on the screen. Um, so I think that's what, and, and it keeps me young. It keeps my mind working. Like, how do I do this now, given the way the world has changed? Because I think also, um, I don't want to be a dinosaur. I don't, I don't, I don't want to tell. I mean, I look at Miracles Boys, my book Miracles Boys, and they have very long chapters. And that was written during a period where people actually read long chapters. And, and those, the ones who do that, there, there are still young people who do that. Um, and there are a lot more who don't. Um, and then we look at the pandemic and we look at the ways in which young people not only are having to catch up on their social, social emotional learning, but on, on their reading skills, like all, we have years of young people who missed all of this re learning how to read, all, all of these literacy skills because, of, because they weren't in the classrooms in that way. And what does that mean and how picture books are presented? Um, um, what does that mean and how early readers are presented? So thinking about that and thinking about being able for, to shift with the change, um, I remember um, the first time, I think, yeah, my daughter was in kindergarten, and and they would have these publishing parties, and and so you know everyone had written all these kindergartners had written books, and and you went and you read their books, and then you wrote blurbs, you wrote little comments on the books, and 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 I was I was the only writer I think in the parent group, so the kids were always really excited for me to read their books, and they and it was my first introduction to kinder writing. And I was like, what fresh hell is this? Because, so none of the, right, they don't spell correct. They, they spell as kindergartners spell, so it's, but they didn't get phonics. So there's no, so I was just like, I don't know what they're saying, but, and then the teacher would have to come and read it to me because she knew how to read kinder writing. And of course me, you know, at that point, and I'm like, but it's spelled incorrectly. Like, at what point do we teach them how to spell before they publish books? <laughs> and, but, but I had to shift, right? I had to think differently because this is how they were learning. They were learning to tell story before they were learning to spell. And it's not up to me to say one way has more value than the other way. But I was so confused. And by the six years later, by the time my son got to kindergarten, I knew how to read kinder right? <laughs> But my mind was blown because I had grown up in the age of phonics, right? So you learned how to spell, and those sentences had to be perfectly spell, spelled and punctuated, you know, in kindergarten and first grade. So when I got out of first and first grade and second grade, I was there were not there was no room for misspelling. Like, how do you have a spelling bee with kinder writing? <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm thinking of young people and literary arts, I'm s starting with the youngest. I'm starting with um, preschool, nursery school, kindergarten. Um, 
And those young people, I guess I'm encouraging their parents, <laughs> but I think it would be their, you know, their parents and caregivers. The, the thing that I found is so fabulous is being read to and going to readings, right? Their earliest readings are librarians sitting and reading them stories, and librarians do such great jobs with books. So, and they're also in circle. They're in community with other young people. Um, and they're engaging in the literature with other young people, which is the beginning of building community and circles and, um, and literary communities. So, so that when they sit in a circle in a writing workshop years later, it's not unfamiliar. Um, I think with um, the older kids, you know, it's hard because I think we, did them a disservice by making them write. I think we thought we were doing the right thing with writing workshops and journals and all of this stuff. I remember as a kid, um, you know, kids have to keep journals, and it's so funny. Um, my son had a journal. I, I actually kept it, and he wouldn't write in it. He wouldn't write in it. He wouldn't write in it. And then his um, advisor, this is when he was in fifth grade, uh, sixth grade, wrote this whole long thing, he, and my son reads differently. Um, and, and she wrote this whole long thing about being dyslexic and, and finding it out as a young person and how it changed her. Right? And it was like two pages. And then he would, and so you write in the journal and then your teacher responds, or your teacher writes and then you respond. And that, he wrote, that's cool. That's it. And then all white space, and that was the end of the journal. And then other journals were just blank. and. And I looked at it, I thought, this is so beautiful what she's written. But for me as a kid, if someone wrote in my journal, I would be, you know, it would be, it would feel like such a violation in this way. And also if someone read my journal, if I was writing a journal, knowing that someone was going to read it, it would be very different writing than I'd write in a journal knowing no one is going to read it. And so we're saying to young people, you have to write journals. and. Your teacher might look at it at some point. It's like, no, no, this is for me. And, and I think um, encouraging young people to keep journals at home that no one's ever going to see. When I sit down to write, the first thing I say is no one is ever going to see this. And what would I write if no one was ever going to read it? And that, that sets the tone for me to feel safe in my writing. And I think there is a way in which we're asking young people to not have that step in their writing, that they're going straight, they're writing in their journals in their classroom, or they're writing in their journals and bringing it to the classroom. They're writing first drafts and showing that to the teachers, and as opposed to um, reading it at home and reading it out loud and getting to the point where you've done enough revision to feel safe with it. Um, so I would say, um, if we want to encourage people to write, let them write how they write, where they write. I wrote on my pants. I wrote on notebooks. So, you know, I was just always writing. But I think um, if there was, a, if I had to write every day in the classroom, or if there was, if there were parameters around it as a young person, I don't think I would be a writer. I think I think it would have broken something for me. Um, so so I side eye writers' workshops in some ways and. I side eye walking into a classroom and saying, and people saying, well, we have 30 writers right here. It's like, okay, then why am I here? Like, you got your writers. And I think, think there is a way in which young people should begin to understand that writing is a process. And that, yeah, it's, it's yes, you can call yourself a writer um, if you want to be a writer. But if you want to be a visual artist, yes, we have you know, 10 writers, we have 10 visual artists, we have 10 musicians, we have three basketball players. Like, let, let, let the young people name themselves and, and don't put this on them because I think that it becomes a weight. Um, and, um, and I think given the fact that we've lost reading, I always encourage audiobooks. I, I think especially for young people, I've gone into classrooms and have read and then I've put on an audiobook of someone else reading, and you just see that they're enwrapped, right? Um, if it's a good one, um, 
and they, and they just want to keep listening. And you see them leaving the classroom in this way and going into the world of that narrative. And for me, that was what made me go, I want to do this. <laughs> you know, I want to be a writer. I want to tell stories because I want to feel this way again and again and again because my first reader is me. And, and my first experience with this story is my own experience with it. So when I'm writing something, if it's really sad, I'm sitting there crying. If it's funny, I'm laughing. And, and I'm having an engagement with the narrative um, that I feel like in having them write something really quickly and not having all of the, not reading it out loud, not um, sitting with it for a week and thinking about it and going back to it in their own private spaces takes away from them. So I can, I, um, writers I love, of course, <laughs> I love Jason Reynolds. Um, of course, I love Mo Willems. I love, um, um, I love Rita Williams Garcia. I love uh, Elizabeth Acevedo. Um, I, um, I'm Derek Barnes, I'm thinking um, The King of Kindergarten, The Queen of Kindergarten. I, I, there's so many books I always forget names of authors, but, um, I'm trying to now, right now I'm reading um, a book by Emma Straub that I love. <laughs> like, it, I'm listening to it on audio. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm, I keep saying I'm going to put a list on my website of people because it never comes to me when I'm asked, even though you gave me this question early on. <laughs> Sorry. I would love to see art in the school exist. Um, it's just so sporadic and, and it's such a, um, and so segregated, economically segregated especially. Um, you know, I've seen so many New York City public schools is where um, they get maybe um, visual art and one semester in theater, maybe another semester. Um, I just remember as a kid, we had it all. You know, we had art every day. Um, we had we had visual art. We had um, we had theater. Um, we had clay. Like we, um, there were so many ways in which we could engage in arts. We didn't have artists coming in. I would love to see more of that. I mean, but then later on in the '90s, under Aggie Gunn, we got. Um, artists in the schools where artists came into underserved schools and worked with young people um, on creative arts. But I think there is a way in which I've seen the change be so much more um, quote unquote academic curriculum and not um, an artist curriculum, artistic cur curriculum. So um, I, I don't really know how to talk about it, but in my perfect world, <laughs> it would be more kind of Waldorfian where kids were using their hands and they were engaging with the art across the, across, um, the subjects in, with art. So, you know, if they were talking about math, they were going outside and measuring trees as they hugged them, you know, um, and they, they were really using the world to talk about art and, um, and to talk about literature and to talk, I think about something like, um, I was in India and <clears throat> they, they were reading Miracles Boys and the first thing they did was go, the, the kid's mom is from Puerto Rico, um, but what the, at the beginning of the book, they talk about Dominicans, and you know, Dominicans are the baddest, then comes brothers, and, um, and the first thing they did was like, let's pull up a map and find out where the Dominican Republic is, and let's look at the foods that the people eat there, and let's talk about the culture, and then let's go to Puerto Rico, and let's go outside and see what plants are indigenous to that country that have made their way here because of the migration of Puerto Ricans to wherever. Um, so, so it's just so, it's such a way to use um, literature and our everyday experiences across the curriculum and that build this artistic sense of the world. Um, and, and that show that um, education doesn't have to be siloed in this way. Um, but 
I feel like we did that a lot more when I was younger, and I would love to see that happening now. Um, and I, I'm not a teacher, so I don't, and, and I'm, you know, not an academic, so I don't know how to make it happen. But, you know, this, uh, none of the books I write exist um, <clears throat> as just ELA, right? It's not like you need to just read this book in ELA. We can look at, we can look at it through the lens of American history. We can look at it through the lens of math. We can look at it through the lens of visual arts. But, um, but I feel like that doesn't happen the way it used to. And it would be great. I mean, maybe that's some of the change that's coming, but um, it would be great to see more of that. So it's interesting in thinking about both This is the Rope and Show Way. I was at a school in Brooklyn and I was talking to fifth graders and this fifth grade girl asked me if my mom had been a slave. <laughs> it was just like, you realize enslavement happened a long time ago. But, but um, you know, just the fact that going back to arts and thinking about um, history, like 30 years, 300 years, in the age of a 10-year-old, it, it gets kind of confusing. And <clears throat> when um, I was writing Show Way, which tracks my family's history back seven generations, I really wanted to pay homage to the fact that I am lucky enough to be a black American who could, to some extent, trace my family's history back to the beginning of their time in this country. Because it's not obviously the beginning of their time. My family is from Western Africa um, before here. Um, but And some of it is stuff that I did you know, kind of cobbled together through various stories. Um, and it was, but it was important for me to just kind of try to get a sense of where I came from. Um, and and, and the, where I came from in the context of America. Um, and I think that I didn't want to navel gaze. I didn't want to be like me, me, me. It's like I'm here because of my grandmother, my great grandmother, my mother. and. Um, and the women that got them here. Um, and the same with This is the Robe. My family migrated from South Carolina to New York City. And, and for me as a kid, we just moved from down south to the city. Um, but in the context of this country, it's a historical move because it was part of the Great Migration from that period. Um, from the early 1900s to the mid-1970s, where millions of black folks left those oppressive conditions for places like Chicago, Philadelphia, California, um, New York, for better opportunities for themselves and their young people. Um, and so those stories, and everybody has that story. Everybody has a story. If you, if you have come from someone, whether you know your biological connections or not, you have a story. Um, even if you've been adopted or, or you know, transracially adopted, there's a story in there that, um, that is your individual story. Um, and I really wanted to put that on the page. I wanted to um, say, I didn't just pop up one day. <laughs> like, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in black, black excellence. I don't believe in exceptionalism. I think each of us has some excellence, some exceptionalism that makes this country work. Um, and, and for me, this was it. This was the story. These were the stories that got me here to being Jacqueline Woodson sitting here talking to you. Um, but I also, I also don't want history erased. And, and I think that there are people who don't want to talk about enslavement um, because it was not a great part in this country's history. There are people who don't want to talk about the fact that this land <laughs> did not belong to us, <laughs> that it was stolen land, that it was conquered land, um, 
that it, that the, the battle to get this land was a bloody one, and that the people who ch were trying to keep their land fought back. Um, um, but when I was um, writing Showway, it was years before this pushback that we're having now, where people are saying we don't want these stories in our school because it makes people feel bad. And I have never thought that I'm not going to tell a story because it's going to make someone feel bad. Because I think um, it's OK to feel bad if, if feeling bad um, leads you to action. And I think about the story of the little match girl, going back to the beginning of this, um, that story made me feel really bad. Like here I was with a home, with a family, having enough to eat, um, having cute clothes to wear. And somewhere in the world at some point in time, um, that was not the case for a young person. And I was, uh, and, and in my neighborhood, I did see kids who didn't have enough to eat. I did see kids who were ragged. And so, so that story of that little match girl was not far from me, even though she was probably Scandinavian in the you know, um, 19th century, and here I was in the 20th century and of color. Um, so, so I think that, um, but that, but that feeling bad was a call to action for me. A and that action eventually came to writing, but also, you know, sharing my lunch with someone. <laughs> I remember as a kid, like asking kids, did they want to share my lunch? Because kids came to school and didn't have food. And it was this whole weird way in which free lunch happened at, you know, um, so, so I do think that um, when I set out to write those books, again, um, it was not to try to teach or anything like that. It was because I wanted to understand myself in the context of American history. And, and that context, for in, in terms of Shoei, is one of love and survival and thriving. Um, and, and, in a world, in a space where we were not meant to survive. You know, we were supposed to come and make more enslaved people that instead of um, calling us enslaved, um, which put the onus on the people who wanted to own black and brown bodies, but uh, they called us slaves, what made it, which makes it seem like this is what we were meant to be, right? There's a very, there's a lot of difference between enslaved and slaves. Um, and, and I wanted to, understand how we did it. Um, and I remember talking to a woman, I think I was in, in Kentucky, and, and she was talking about the quilts, um, the, under, you know, the quilts that were used in the Underground Railroads as maps. And, and she said, well, that didn't really happen um, because no one has written about it, and, and, um, and there, there's no written record of it. And I said, you realize we weren't allowed to learn to read and write. And you realize that if this was something that enslaved people were using to try to escape, they weren't going to tell white folks about it. <laughs> like, like so, but there was this disconnect, like how could something be a part of history and I not know, I as a white person not know it. Um, so, so, and I think that's been the case for our people for, you know, generations of not only the gaslighting, but the like, but your story's not valid. Your story didn't really happen. It didn't really happen like that. Um, so, but, and, and when, for me, I wanted to put it into a book. The same with um, This is the Rope. Like, I think the Great Migration is a story people don't, they're learning more about, but I, I didn't understand my context, and I wanted to understand that. And by extension, it's out in the world and other people understand theirs too. It's hard because I think um, for every lived experience, there's someone disqualifying it, right? For, for every point in history that was empowering, there's someone saying, that didn't matter, or stop talking about that, or um, that's a race thing, or anything that will um, shut the conversation down. And I, I remember as a kid, whenever um, 
our teacher talked about slaves, because that's what they called them then, um, oh, the black kids in the room would you know, just kind of shrivel. Uh, and and the, the um, Latinx kids and the white kids um, would be on the schoolyard saying, you were a slave. That's why you were a slave, you know? Um, and, and, you know, the Latinx kids not even realizing the, the transatlantic slave movement and what happened and how they also came from um, the same place, you, you know, from the same conditions, but just ended up somewhere else, like the Dominican Republic. Um, and then the white kids not realizing, well, if I'm, you know, Irish or German or what, like I played some part in this that was not good. So because it wasn't taught that way, right? It wasn't taught to be made to understand that this impacted all of us, right? And um, and I think that that's what's really hard now to talk to young people is getting through the noise, uh, and there is so much noise, uh, and and it is also very curated, right? Like I. I'm thinking about something like TikTok, where I think my son mostly just watches um, bodybuilding videos, right? And because he's 14, and and this is where he is now. And whereas my 20-year-old, who's at Howard and and not on social media as much, is is getting more of a sense of a lot of other stuff. Um, but I I think that. The challenge is pulling them away from social media back to print. And I, because I think print is also meditative in this way. And through print, uh, and print feels to me often like some truth um, that, that can break through the noise. But, but I do think that it comes back to communities too, to being able to be around people who are having these conversations that, where they can ask questions. And, and the fact that so many people are unwilling to have the conversation with them. I, I even think about my, grand, my mom and my grandma, like they didn't wanna talk about the South. It was, they had PTSD, you know, they had come out of a Jim Crow South. They had witnessed lynchings, I'm sure. And, all the stuff that was um, heartbreaking about that place in their time. Um, so we, we shut, if something on television, like a Cicely Tyson, like Miss Jane Pittman, I'm, I remember my parents were like, we're not watching that. Um, because they didn't want to see that suffering because um, they had lived it. Um, and, and we didn't come to the table talking about it. So, so there were silences, and I think this happens in a lot of households of all colors, that there is this conversation that parents aren't willing to have or don't know how to have. I think uh, in a lot of white households, the conversation of race is one that people don't know how to have. And I think about you know, the people I know who are transracially adopted, I, um, trying to have those conversations with their parents, especially in this time of, um, you know, post George Floyd and Sandra Bland and the other many people who continue to get killed, but, and people are defensive, are, are, they're so heartbroken. They have a hard time talking about it, but um, it, I don't know, I, I really, it's one I'm still trying to figure out, like how to get the young people to and maybe they already are maybe they are maybe i'm so far out of it that they're, they're taking care of business and having the conversations and doing the work they need to do um and and are able to do it without someone who's so much older than them trying to figure it out for them but i don't know you know i I am the queen of putting my head in a hole. <laughs> it was so funny because um, we were, I was at a friend's house and um, they were playing celebrities and it's this game where you put a whole bunch of names in a hat and then you have to give clues. But they had put, uh, uh, this time we did it, they put a name of a person on your back. And, um, and, and 
the person gives you clues about them. And, and my, my beloved is like, she's not going to guess it. She, she, this is too current for her. And it was Selinsky. And, and, um, and so, and, I, and they're like, he always has a green sweatshirt. Thank you, Crane. Thank, you know, he's going to get the Nobel Prize. I was like, no clue. So, and, and I had, uh, I stopped. I, I had to, I'm writing, um, and I'm writing about Ida B. Wells, which is the wrong thing to stop reading the papers for. <laughs> but, but I had to put my head in a hole for about four months because it was so much news coming at me, um, and it's hard for me to turn it off. And so, you know, when... Um, the invasion of Ukraine started happening. I'm like, I can't, you know, and and all and and um, even the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Um, my beloved is like, okay, I just want you to look at this. I'm not asking you to look at the whole times, but just look at this map to see who's going to be impacted, what states are going to be impacted by it. There's so I'm like, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> um, but but it 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 is this it is this self care thing that. I do, and then when I'm out of my writing bubble, I catch up on everything and just spend, you know, days and days catching up on the news and figuring out what's going on in the world to recenter myself that way. Um, but but it is this way in which I I have to turn the world off, and and um, and I know it's very hard for young people to do, but but it it for me it's like I I'm gonna curate all the information coming at me like I can take in that I can take in that play I can take in this new book I can take in even that nonfiction but but in terms of a whole lot of other stuff I I, I have to turn it off um, and and what it means is for a while I'm a lot less informed than a lot of people <laughs> um, but but it I, w I was asking um, Eric earlier about reading the paper because we get we get the times and I just like I can't look at it today I'm not even looking at the headlines because it will li literally stop my work um, and I think that for me it's a way of surviving um, but for but someone um, for someone else that that wouldn't work because they need to know what's going on to feel centered um, and I think um, for young people, like I, I do think from my, when I'm thinking of my son, um, it's an escape, right? It's an escape. They stuff is coming at them. They uh, they hear what's happening. They see what's happening, and 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 the desperation of looking, scrolling through TikTok is a way of I think doing the same thing that I'm doing, um, but differently. I remember asking my daughter um, when she was 16 about how she's coping with everything because at that time there was so much stuff going on and she's like you know at the end of the day I'm 16 so I'm going to still want to go to my parties I'm going to still want to hang out with my friends and and go shopping and and so that part is not getting stopped which is such a beautiful sentiment sentiment to me in some ways because it speaks to their resilience right it speaks to them being able to be like water around things that they can't control and and I think at the same time we see them out they're marching you know about climate change and black lives mattering and um, Roe v Wade and all of these ways in which young people are taking the reins and saying that you all left us this world but we're not going to leave it for our children. So, so I, I think in that way, I don't need to figure it out. <laughs>
people can look at someone and and say, you know, this person is so evil. It's like, yeah, and um, because I, I really have the sense that no one is all bad or no one is all good, and they'll say, what about or what about? And it's like human, human, like like yes, evil, doing evil. Um, seeming like they're soulless and and then at the same and, and my mind goes to the question wow when did that person get broken and and where 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 is that wound and and it, is it fixable you know and I think that that's um that's what empathy looks like it's so easy to look at someone and say that person and be binary about it right but, but to look outside of yourself with a sense of complexity when looking at others, that, to me that's empathy, that's, that's seeing the whole person. So I first came to the Kennedy Center um, with my book Locomotion, which is a book that's uh, the story of Lonnie Collins Motion, who is 10 years old, um, who's 11 years old and learning to tell the story of his life through poetry. And I wrote, I wrote the play for that, that ended up being here at the Family Theater many, many years ago. Um, and I wanted to write the play because, again, that was the first book I'd written in poems that was seriously close to my heart, and that is the story of a kid coming to find his voice as a writer, so of course. He's inspired by me. Um, and we, we brought the play to the family theater and um, had phenomenal actors performing and lots of school groups coming. And, and so that, that was pretty much my introduction to the Kennedy Center, to the family theater, uh, to uh, theater for young people in general. Um, and then, I kept in touch with the Kennedy Center and and I'm good friends with Mo and um, and the play and locomotion ended up traveling. It's actually about to get put back up, uh, I think in Florida. But then years later, uh, I was invited to be the second education artist in residence here, and so here I am. I think especially after this week, my biggest, imp the thing I want to happen here is I want people to know that this place is for them, especially DC people. I'm talking DC, I'm, I'm talking DC DMV, I'm talking folks of color. I, I, I feel like the work is to get folks of color into the Kennedy Center, walking around the Kennedy Center, having their lunch here, you know, having their, you know, doing the electric slide on the grass. Like, I don't understand why this place sits in the heart of Washington, D.C., and our people aren't here. Like, I don't know if it's by accident. I don't know if it's by design. But, but, but there's something not working right now in terms of why our people aren't coming here. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think we've been able to get the you know, Georgetown people here. Yeah, I think I think pockets of the com of communities are coming, but I would love for people to feel like this is a place they belong to, that they're invited to, that that they don't have to explain. Um, you know, you can come here. You don't have to be dressed up. You don't have to spend a lot of money. All of those parts are in place, but what? What is happening? Why why don't why aren't folks filling the space? And and I would like before I leave to see this be a multiracial, <laughs> um, multi economic space that people feel welcome in. I, I think about um, New York City. We have um, the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and the Brooklyn Museum was like this. You know, you'd go inside, and and um, there were very few people who looked like me inside. And then they started doing first night, and, and it was a night where they brought in music and basically opened up parts of the Brooklyn Museum to everybody. 
and oh my goodness, did it change. You see young white families dancing with their kids. You see, you know, young black and brown teenage, um, teenagers there on dates. You see old people coming to dance. I mean, it changed the game. It was, it's so beautiful. That first night is just, it, it's, it just represents this country in this way. And, you know, people coming from Brownsville, people coming from Park Slope, from, you know, the wealthy neighborhoods, the poor neighborhoods, intergenerational engagement. Um, and, and I would love to see that happen here. I would love, it, it's a way of people getting to engage with each other in a way they might not otherwise have. It's a way to begin to have conversations that the audiences aren't, um, um, looking, aren't one, looking all like, all aren't the same race <laughs> in. But I would like, I would really like to see that multiracial, multigenerational um, engagement happening. And before I leave, it would be great to see like the reach have people of all colors and ages and, you know, um, genders on the grounds just engaging. Um, it would be beautiful. And I, it, when that happens, I'll feel like my work is done here. <laughs> you know, I have my daughter taking flyers over to Howard and taking them to black churches and, and old folks' homes. It's like, get the people here. Like, this is, weekends in the, like, this is, this is their space. Like, why aren't they here engaging? So I'm working on it. So this is from Brown Girl Dreaming, and it's called Brown Girl Dreaming. Who is this brown girl dreaming, my teacher wants to know, staring out the window so, head and hands and eyes gone from here. Where are you, dear? Come back to the classroom, my pretty brown girl. I fear you're halfway around the world. Where is that mind of yours now? Outside the winter stabs through the air, sneaks past the window pane and there. Beneath a truck, a frozen bird being sniffed by a stray cat. I don't yet know the word disdain. But in this moment, the world feels far away. I dream of stepping out into it one day to rest my feet in unfamiliar sand, to touch the hand of a boy or girl on the other side where is nighttime now or summer there and maybe return to this place, a different girl with just a trace of who I used to be echoing somewhere nearby to me. As the teacher goes on and on, her words is suddenly becoming a poem that I may sing on an orange afternoon inside a room where people will know my name.